Oh, um. I would like to uh, talk today about instance reducibilities and viral degrees, which is something that I've been prompted to do by submission to a special issue. Um, what is it? CCA and CCC together is Alex, which, right? Um, We're CCC and CCC together. Oh, CCC and CCC together. Okay, two CCCs conferences. And at one of them, uh, a long time ago, I spoke about this. Uh, and uh, this uh, was, um, we st I started working on this with um, Kazuto Yoshimura. A student of um, Ishihara's from JAIST, but then at some point he disappeared, and even Hajime doesn't know where Kazuto is. So I, I I just couldn't finish it together with him, and I thought it still is, it, the the work should be finished, so I finished it up. Um, but uh, we really started working on this together, and then at some point, I think he even gave a talk about it, maybe at one of the CCAs, an early version of this. Um, but a lot has changed since then. Um, okay, so um, I would like to, sh I would like to, first, I, well, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of give a, the, uh, an improved version of, of, of what, I, what I had at CCC. And uh, the topic is reductions between problems. So when uh, you have typically two problems that are not solvable in some sense, maybe they are not computable or maybe they're not constructively provable statements and you'd like to measure when one of them is harder than the other and to motivate. So at first we're going to look at this in the context of constructive math and then we're going to relate it to viral degrees. And I'm going to show that viral reducibility is just in a very straightforward way corresponds precisely to a very natural notion of reducibility between constructive statements. And moreover, I'm going to um, generalize the viral degrees uh, and uh, thereby uh, make it possible to uh, uh, extend the scope of the study of viral degrees and also improve the structure of viral degrees at the same time. But let's go, uh, let's do things in order. So first I would like to uh, do the constructive bit, which is called instance reducibility. Um, Andre, yes? you, you said you wanted to record, but I don't see... Ah, I'm not recording, yes. Uh, oh, you don't, uh, I'm not recording on Zoom, but I am recording on my computer because there is a dot here. I'm, oh, okay. I'm doing it with a different piece of software, which is better than Zoom. Okay. Thanks for reminding me. So let's motivate uh, instance reducibilities with an example. And the example is the following. So we're going to work in constructive math. And let's ask about the following Im implication. So. Uh, if every real number is non-negative or positive, so that's a statement that is not provable constructively, then every binary sequence is all zeros or it contains a one. So if you take a binary sequence, then either it's going to, oh, let me do this so that the disjuncts correspond to each other. Either it's always zero or it has a one. This is also known as LPO, limited principle of omniscience. So how does one prove such statements? Well, very often, in fact, if you look at various proofs in constructive mathematics, you will see that there is a method which is by far the most common method, and it goes like this. You say, consider any f. 
Well, of course, before that, we also say assume one. Right? Assume this, now we're proving that. Uh, sorry, this is supposed to be a for all. Okay, so let's review this. If all, if real numbers are totally ordered, then LPO holds. So for every infinite binary sequence, you can decide this. By the way, you should stop and ask questions as I go on. Um, don't wait, just, just speak up and say something. And I'm also going to open chat, which already has two questions. Yes and okay. Ah, that was regarding me being hurt. Okay, so consider any F then what we do is we define a certain real number. Uh, well, you can define it like this, for instance, so limit over n to, to the minus, and then we take the least k such that uh, f of k, we're looking for a 1, right? So f of k equals one, sorry, it's going to be the, the largest, not the least. The largest, no, that's not true, it's the least. The least, such that f of k equals one, or k equals n. So this is just a tricky way of defining, well, it's not tricky, this is a way of defining x uh, in such a way that if f is all zeros, then here, this is never going to be true. So if f is all zeros, we're going to get the limit of n of 2 to the minus n, which is 0. So if f is all zeros, x will be 0. If f has a 1, say at some place k, then eventually this is going to stabilize at 2 to the minus k, where k is the least such number that f is 1. And so in that case, x will be positive. So now we have... If x is zero, but all I mean, we really need if x is less than zero, then oh, okay. So uh, let's let's be careful about how we prove this. Now we have this x, and by one, either x is less than zero or x is less than or equal to 0, or x is greater than 0, and now there are two possibilities. If x is less than 0, then by the argument given just now, f has to be 0 everywhere, and if x is greater than 0, then you can stick, stick a, a small power of 2 between x and 0, and that will show that um, x is, because x is positive, you will be, show, be able to show that this sequence here converges to something positive and you will be able to extract k there, so then there exists a k such that f of k equals 1. I might as well, okay, so I'm not being very polite with bound variables here. But anyhow, the point is that this is a very typical way of proving reduction, proving implications between uh, statements in constructive mathematics. Uh, just a second. Prosim. Ej, jaz sem nasred seminarja in predavam, tako da zdaj ne morem. Ok, čau. Um, there are many, many other such examples, and so uh, this way of proving uh, the implication between two universal statements is quite common, so we're going to give it a name. And so uh, let's have a definition, because this is a recurring pattern. Um, oh, so maybe what was the recurring pattern? Okay, so, so what was the pattern that we observed here? The pattern was fo the following. We started by saying we're trying to prove that one universal statement implies another universal statement. Uh, I want to do this backwards, probably the way, I, the way I'm used to writing this, I want this one to be like this. So we have one universal statement and we want to prove this one.
And the way we do this, we actually prove something different that implies this implication, which is that we said, well, for every function there was a number. So for everything on this side, there is something on that side. For every x in A, there is a y in B, such that then psi of y implies phi of x. And this, is, this was the method of proof we just used. So we would like to um, give this thing a name. So let's write phi like this to say that that phi is a predicate on A. So an alternative way of writing this would be to say something like phi is a function from A to truth values or if you are more topos oriented you would use omega here for the truth values but I'm just going to write it like this so because you can think of a predicate as the extent of uh, the subset that it, uh, it characterizes so now um, we define uh, I want a pretty color where are pretty colors here are pretty colors okay so we say what is instance reducibility So given two such predicates, phi and psi, we're going to write it like this. Phi is instance reducible to psi if, well, that statement up here, it's this statement. Why do I call this instance reducible? Because what we're saying is that we are trying to establish one instance of phi of x. So, and then, um, so to prove one instance of phi of x, we find a suitable single instance, we find a suitable instance of, of psi, namely y. So for every x, so we find some y such that the the, the instance psi implies the instance phi of x. So because it's this reduction of instance by one by one, that's why I think it's, it's a good name. Okay, so uh, this is uh, now just defining the method observed. And if you go and you rummage through proofs in constructive math, you will see that this is quite common. Well, here we have one instance goes for one instance. So for a, for a one instance x, you're supposed to find one instance y. Sometimes you may wish to find many instances of y, or countably many, or, or two or three. And in the preprint, I, I show that you can easily um, modify uh, predicates so that uh, then instance reducibility, you put something here on psi, you, you parameterize it by how many instances you want, and then you can uh, also uh, capture other forms where you need several instances, several y's to to get a single x. So, but I'm not going to speak about that. Uh, so what is this thing like? Well, so first of all, quite obviously, this thing is a pre-order, by which I mean it's reflexive and transitive. And the way this is oriented is that you should think of harder problems higher up in the order. So um, lower ones are easier. So the, low, the lower ones are more easily proved to be true. Okay. So this is about showing that something holds for all y or for all x. So lower down is easier to prove that it holds. Phi lower down is easier to prove that it holds for all, for all arguments. Okay, so it's a pre-order, but what else can we say about it? And um, so it's kind of a, a strange thing for several years. I was so with Kazuto, we calculated that this thing looks a lot like it's, it's almost, it, it looked like, um, well, it was a lattice. It's a distributive lattice. Then we discovered it has 
set index uh, prima, then I discovered it has index infima, but notice that it's a large preorder in the sense that we are ordering all predicates on all sets. So that's a proper class, that's not a set. Okay, so the, the, this kind of bothered me and then just before I think one day before my last CCC talk, I realized that actually this thing is equivalent to a small order. So let's do that. So let's, because we can then immediately uh, get a lot of structure out of it. So uh, let us show that this pre-order actually is equivalent to something else that is already known. Um, and for that, I just need a little bit of preparation. So if I have a pool set P, then, and the sum set, uh, a set A, oops, a subset of P, then say that this set is upper if the following holds if it's upward closed. So if X is in A and Y is above A, then Y is also in A. So that's what an upper set is. And then every set can be made into an upper set by the operation of upper closure, which is just, if I have any set, let's call it B now. So if I have some subset B of P, then I can just take all Y's in P such that there is something in B which, which is below it. And this one will always be upper. And uh, using this closure, so you just go and you close upward. Um, there is a thing called the Smith preorder, which comes from domain theory and power domains. Beware, I'm going to use the reverse order to what Mike Smith de defined, because I need this order to match my order here and I don't want to keep turning everything around so we'll just turn it around once and violate the official definition. So uh, the reverse pre-order this is taking any such A and B subsets of P we say that A is below B in the Smith pre-order if the upper closure of A is below the upper closure of B. So when you close them up, A is smaller. Um, this turns out to be is the same thing as saying for every X in A that exists a Y in B such that Y is below X. And now this should look suspiciously close to what we just had because there we had for every X in A that exists a Y in B such that some implication holds. So um, that's nice. Um, if we, oh, by the way, if we take the upper sets, U on P, so this is all subsets of P which are upper sets, that is to say, if I close it upward, it stays the same. This is a frame, so it's a complete heighting algebra, has an implication and so on, so it's a very nice lattice. Oh, ordered by, you just say ordered by subset. Uh, and uh, suprema, for instance, the supre because the supremum of upper sets is upper, you can just, uh, sorry, the union of upper sets is upper, uh, you can just use unions, uh, um, Unions are suprema, um, so it's, 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 it's easy. And uh, well, actually an intersection of upper sets is upper, so um, this is also easy. And uh, moreover, the map, I'm not going, really going to use this, but uh, I can maybe mention it. The map which goes from the power set of P to the upper set of P, the upward closure, this is the poset reflection. That is to say, it's the best way to turn this pre-order on the power set into a partial order, but that's not really going to be important for us. Uh, Positive reflection of what? Well, of this order. 
of this pre-order. It turns it, so if you quotient, this is a pre-order, so if you quotient by equivalence, you will get something that's uh, isomorphic to uh, U of P. Okay, um, now we also need the object of truth value, so I'm going to write this as, as omega, so let this be the set of truth values. The type theorists in the audience might think that they need to write it like this, or some other type theoretic thing, and uh, one thing that may help is to uh, notice that this is isomorphic to the power set of the singleton set. So it's just that. Constructively, we cannot say that this is a two-element set. Um, but we can say constructively that this, element, this set does not have three distinct elements. So think of it, if you, if you just wandered in from, uh, from the TTE world, you, might, you must have heard these talks, uh, constructive talks before, but one way to think of omega is that it's a funny space on, it's like it has two points and maybe a topology or some computability structure on it. Um, but it's kind of dangerous to think of it as having two points. And it's, it's wrong to think of it as having three points. Anyhow, here's a theorem. Theorem. Instance reducibilities. Instance reducibilities. Are equivalent to the uh, Smith pre-order on P of omega, so whichever way you want to say this, maybe like this, to U of omega, right? Because this is a frame, it's nice. Um, this is not too difficult to prove. In fact, all the proofs, if you look at the preprint, I don't. Really, I didn't really include very many proofs. I did formalize a lot of them. All the. I think all of the constructive part I formalized in cock, because it was easier than to fiddle with stupid first order logic, uh, and um, it all just reduces all the time to, you know, you have a bunch of for all exists implications, and then you go blah, 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 and then you prove it. So it's easier to do it in cock at least for me. But anyway, let's see how this works, because it is going to give us some uh, impression of um, what this does. Okay, so, um, proof outline. First, how do we turn a predicate? What do we need to do? Okay, so, I would have to turn a predicate to an element of U of omega, but I don't have to. I'm going to instead show equivalence with, okay, so we're going to show equivalence with, not with this U, but with the power set of omega ordered by the Smith pre-order. And this is okay, Ugh. this is okay because the upper sets in omega are the posset reflection of this thing here, and so they are already equivalent. That's a basic fact about posset reflections. So uh, it's, if I, it's, it's just slightly easier to write down formulas if I can just use the Smith pre-order and arbitrary sets. Okay, so a predicate is going to be mapped to f of phi. What does this need to be? Well, this needs to be an element in here, so I need to define a set of truth values, and I just say, well, it's the image. So it's truth values of the form phi of x for x in A, or if you want to be super formal, truth values in omega such that there exists an x in A such that p is equivalent to phi of x. So that's one direction. And in the other direction, if I have a subset of omega, let's call it theta, we're going to map that to the inclusion, so we'll call this one g, it's the inclusion of theta into omega. What does that mean? Well, that this needs to be, so what does this say? So this needs to be a predicate, 
So which predicate is it? Well, it's the predicate theta is a subset of omega. That is to say, given any p in uh, given any p in um, omega, the predicate holds precisely when p is in theta. So what this needs to be checked? Well, one has to check first of all that f and g are monotone with respect to the Smith preorder and implication on omega. Uh, sorry, and uh, containment in mu of omega. So uh, what am I saying? No, sorry. Monotone with respect to instance reducibility. I'm getting ahead of myself. Instance reducibility and the Smith preorder. And then we need to check that we have an equivalence. So what we would need to do is we need to check that g of f of phi is instance equivalent to phi and f of g of some theta is Smith equivalent to theta. Um, actually, this one becomes, this one actually is an equation. If you go around, you will see that this one is just equal. Um, so how am I doing on time? I so this is all spelled out in the, in the, um, in the preprint, and it's not very illuminating to go through this proof, but it's just good because it's, it's, it's what Dana Scott uh, called, it's, it's a, uh, you follow your nose, you get the proof. So there's nothing to do. You just unfold the definitions. The interesting bit about this is that we now have a corollary. And more is worried that I don't know how to spell corollary, and apparently I don't. I'm going to bet that it's with double L. Corollary yes. um, is that instance reducibilities form a, well, large, but essentially small, because they are equivalent to a small one. frame. In particular, this immediately gives us things like arbitrary suprema and implication and it's a distributive lattice and so on. And I think for the TTE Weiroch reducibility, this is going to be the interesting bits, of course, stuff that's outside of being a distributive lattice. Uh, like arbitrary suprema, which, by the way, you have to be careful how you understand these, because once we interpret this constructive stuff in realizability, these suprema are not just suprema, they are uh, a suitably effective version of suprema, so uh, it needs to be, you know, computable suprema. It's the same phenomenon as um, um, uh, completeness, say, completeness of real numbers. The computable reals are not Cauchy complete, they're computably Cauchy complete, right? So that's the same phenomenon there. And I think this is, this is maybe interesting that we're going to get an implication for viral degrees. Okay, but what does this order look like? So let's have a bit of a, let's get a bit of a feeling. Sorry, can I ask a question? Sure, of course. Um, yeah, so, you, so you're showing that um, the instance reducibilities are essentially small and that's crucially relying on having an predicative omega. Yes. Um, a set of true values. Can you derive an impredicative omega from the essential smallness of the instance reducibilities? So if you didn't, so is it? So uh, I will show that omega can be identified as a principal ideal in the post set of instance reducibilities. Okay, and so after I've shown that, you can then tell me whether I did whether whether, whether then it can be done. Well, I, I doubt I'll be able to tell you that, but um, it sounds, so it's, so uh, omega. So yeah, if yeah. omega exists, then it is equivalent to a principal ideal of instance reducibilities below a specific instance reducibility degree. So, but that principal ideal always exists. Ah, but it might not be. It might not be small. It might. Uh, you don't know it's small. So. Okay. I, so you're, yeah. you're not. Okay. Yeah. 
Thanks. So I also give in the in the in the preprint I also give this structure suprema infima. I explicitly calculate the structure without relying on the equivalence with the Smith preorder. So even if I don't have omega, I have the formulas for all of this structure, except for except for implication. I think is a bit tricky. Okay. Um, so, what, but let's let's draw a picture of, of the degrees. What do they look like? Okay. So the structure. Okay. So first, what's at the top? Well, the top degree is the degree of the false predicate on the singleton. Or, in fact, any... Okay, so why is that? Well, so if I write down phi is below top, this means for every x in A... Okay, whatever. For every x in A, there exists a, a y in the unit type, such the unit set, such that uh, false, because this is the false predicate, such that the false predicate implies 5x. Well, this is just true. So it's all its holes. Because, well, take any x, the y is going to be the single, the, the element of y, and false implies anything. And in more generally, uh, we can ask which predicates are equivalent to the top degree. So phi is going to be... Um, equivalent to the top degree, which is the same as saying that it's above it, if it has a counterexample. Counterexample, by which I mean there is some x in A, such that not phi of x. And uh, it's really literally just means unfold this definition, and you will see that you get that. Okay, uh, so that's good to know. Well, it's not too surprising. If you have a counterexample, you stand no chance of showing that for all x, phi of x holds, right? And the, the reducibility is measure how difficult it is for a predicate to hold universally. So um, if there is an exam there is a counterexample, then that's going to be difficult indeed. Okay, so what's at the bottom? At the bottom we have the predicate which is most easily seen to be universally true. And that turns out to be the predicate on the empty set. Well, there's only one. And that one is easy because the reducibility starts with for every x in empty, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's true. Yeah. So that's the bottom. Is there anything else? Um, yes. So there is a third degree, if you stare at this and you say, how about this one? I'm going to call it T1 for reasons given later, which is, you say, 1 is a subset of 1. So the true predicate on the singleton, so you take the singleton and everything is true, well, then you can easily see that this one is sitting in between, you have bottom, and then you have this one, and then you have top, like this. Okay, what else? Okay, so you could calculate um, the following. When is, let's see what's below, let's see what's below T1, okay? When is phi below T1? And now you unfold. And you get, okay, so what does this mean? This means for every x in A, there exists a y in 1, such that true, because everything is true in T1, implies uh, 5x. Well, but that's the same thing as saying for all x in A, 5x. So below, we have predicates which are universally true. So the stuff that's below here just holds. But because instance reducibility is, 
a more refined relation than actual implication between universal statements. That does, that does not imply that the stuff below T1 collapses. In fact, uh, the T1 and the bottom degree are actually different. So um, what we get is we can do the following. Define for any A the predicate TA, which is... So the predicate, which is universally true on A. And now what we have here is that if we look at the things below T1, we get precisely these kinds of predicates. So below T1, there are all these predicates. Um, and you can ask, okay, but what do they look like? If now I just take the principal ideal, so the principal ideal below T1, well, we know it's predicates of the form bottom A, but you can also ask when does it hold that you have bottom A is below bottom B, and you can work this out, and then you stare at it, and you realize after a while, that um, the principal ideal below T1 is equivalent to omega with implication. So that means that we have now embedded omega. I'm not going to go through the proof. Uh, but I can maybe tell you how we embed omega. So given any p in omega, embed as the true predicate on the extent of p, where this is just the extent of p is the subset of the unit set such that p holds. Um, Okay, um, and uh, the other direction, uh, you can, everything is in the paper. I'm not going to go through all of this. So that's good because now we have here, well, we know that here we have omega, more or less, like that. What's above, what is above here? So you can also ask what is above here. So let me just draw a picture again. So we have this T1, then here there's some stuff that we don't know yet, and there's top. Here, we have things which are below, and so that's uh, bottom, and this we know is equivalent to omega, more or less. Well, it is equivalent to omega. As it turns out, here, you, are, you there is an interesting bit in here, which is omega upside down. So you can embed omega in two ways. And the other embedding here is an anti-monotone embedding of, of omega. And then you can also ask, well, is there something outside of this? Maybe it's all like this. And we are in a funny constructive situation where you're saying, well, you can't show that there is nothing outside. You cannot explicitly produce anything that is outside, but assuming that everything is just either this omega or omega in standing on its head, that is just the union of these two parts. If you assume that, then you get excluded middle. So, um, so this is a fairly good picture, but not quite exact. And if you think about the Smith uh, power domain on, 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 on omega, then, I mean, this is the sort of picture that, that you would think of. What is the time? It's 11-ish. Okay, so I'm going to say one more thing. So now we have these two copies of omega, and then outside of that, there's kind of something, but maybe not really anything. Maybe this is worth pointing out. I have a characterization. I'm just going to mention one bit. Lem, excluded middle, holds if and only if. This picture here is just the three-point set. So if and only if we get the picture where we have precisely just these three and nothing else. So if you say every instance degree, so every 
phi is either either phi is top or phi is this middle thing or phi is this bottom thing. So to say that that's it is the same as excluded middle, uh, which means that uh, instance reducibility is extremely boring in classical logic and would never be considered there. This is only relevant for constructive mathematics. Um, okay, so one other little thing. We said here that at the bottom, at the top, we have the predicates which have a counterexample. Okay, well, how about the predicates that don't have a counterexample? Well, these are called not not dense. So not not dense means um, for all x in A, not not phi of x. That is to say, the double negation of the predicate is universally true. But this is the same thing as saying not there exists x in A, not phi of x. Uh, if you're worried that this might this there's something wrong with this equivalence constructively, no, it's okay. And um, this, well, this just says it's not the top degree. So this is the same as saying it's not the top degree. Good, but we can do better. Proposition phi is not not dense if and only if phi is below excluded middle. So if you can show that if you need that it's if it's reducible to excluded middle. Uh, what is excluded middle? Well, excluded middle is a predicate on omega defined by you, you say, well, does when does this predicate hold of P? It's when P is decidable, when P or not P. And uh, there is the closely related double negation elimination predicate which says that the double negation of p implies p and it's an exercise to show that in fact the usual proof of excluded middle and double negation elimination are equivalent principles it's actually an instance reduction you open a book you see that they use one instance of len for one instance of double negation elimination and the other way around and so it's an instance reduction. Um, and then what is easier to show, in fact, is that phi is not not dense if phi is below D and E. It's easier to work with D and E. And this is not difficult either. There is something in the check. For viral reducibility, we know that it isn't isomorphic to the reverse partial order. How does that connect to the status of outside? Oh, so... Arno, are you asking what happens if we turn this thing around? That's a good question. I don't think you will get the same order. I don't think you get the same order because if you turn, uh, uh, let's see, is that that's the same as asking what happens if we turn around the Smith power domain on omega? Um, the domain theorist in the audience can answer that question, but um, I don't think you get. It's not. It's not. It's not going to be symmetric. It would be. I would be amazed if it's symmetric. But I haven't thought about it. That's a. That's that's a good question. I mean, I haven't actually uh, positively proved that it won't be uh, symmetric. So it's now 11:02. I know that at some point Guido has to go somewhere. Has he already disappeared? Yes. Um, this is as much as I wanted to say about instance reducibilities. Are there any questions about this constructive part? Um, in a way, you know, it's kind of trivial because we're just studying the Smith power domain on omega. You know, how interesting can that be? But on the other hand, I think it's nice that um, we have this sort of same framework for talking about reducibilities in constructive math as has already existed for a long time in computable mathematics. So I think this is good. And what's going to be even better is that uh, we're going to show that this, in fact, is the same thing. Because by the interpretation, uh, realizability interpretation, 
will get one from the other. Um, I would be in favor of a short break at this point, if, uh, what do you think? Yeah? Okay? So, shall we say we reconvene at 11.10? That's enough to make a coffee. Uh, 11, 10. And I should remember to re keep recording. Because I'll stop it now. Pause. Okay, so let's uh, now work towards um, relating all of this to uh, Bayroch degrees. So. Um, the next thing that I would like to speak about is, because we're generalizing them, I'll call them extended viral degrees. It's, it might not be too late to rename them if somebody has, uh, thinks that this is bad. Okay, so, um... Everything that we have done so far is constructive and can be interpreted, so we could interpret instances in uh, realizability models. There are many ways to do this, um, and uh, it, we don't, fortunately, we don't have to work with um, toposes, which are quite complicated, realizability toposes, because, as I argue, I show in the preprint, because every object, every object in the topos is covered by an assembly, and you can then, but you can then pull back. Uh, predicates on arbitrary objects to predicates on assemblies and show that every instance reducibility in the topos is already equivalent to some instance on an assembly, so we don't have we can use assemblies which are a lot easier to work with. And uh, I'm not going to try to give uh, um, a uh, complete overview of realizability here. I will try to speak to um, speak to, the, uh, to, to that part of the audience that is familiar with, uh, um, well, either with, uh, already is familiar with realizability or computable mathematics and, um, and, and has, uh, has seen these things before, but we don't really have to get into technical details. What I think I will do is I will rather explain in very explicit terms what you get when you perform this interpretation. So um, then you will see the similarity with viral degrees. So we're going to work with some PCA. So that's a model of computation. You can think Turing machines or you can think type 2 Turing machines, things like that. So this one you should think of what represents the data. So to really think of A as well, how do we represent data? Is it numbers? Is it sequences? And we're also going to have elem an elementary. The app calls them elementary sub PCA and this is how you represent data and this is what computable means uh, for type 2 effect for type 2 uh, effectivity what you would do is you would take a the a is the bare space and it forms a PCA, as is well known. And then A prime is the sub is the subset of the recur of, of total recursive maps. So it's the it's the total computable maps. It's the computable part of the bare space. And we're going to use A to represent data, and we're going to use A prime to realize uh, functions and statements. Okay. So then, what is an assembly? I do need I do want to say that out. I spell that out. An assembly is uh, given by two things a set and 
this is the realizability relation, and so it's a relation on A cross S such that everybody has a realizer. For every X in S, there exists some R in A that realizes it. So we say here that R realizes X. Um, this is uh, equivalent to having multivalued representations in terms of TTE because we didn't here, we allow the same R to realize many X's. So when you look at which X's, does a, which X's are uh, realized by a given name R, you could get many X's and that's why it would be a multivalued representation. This is a super nice category. Not quite a topos, but you get a lot of bank for very little complexity. It's a simple definition. We also have to review what, a, what, what, what is a realizability predicate. So a, in realizability, we work with realizability predicate. Well, that's a map phi from the under so this is a predicate on some assembly S. It's a map which takes elements of S and it gives you sets of realizers. And we write R is an element of phi of X as R realizes phi of X. And uh, you might be wondering whether I made a mistake here because uh, in a topos, you need to require this map to be to have two further properties. Um, but I did not make a mistake because one of the properties comes for free, and the other one I will build in into logical entailment. We also have to say not just what predicates are, but what does what one does what what is the order on them? What's the logical order on them? So we're going to say that given another one. So if we have phi and psi predicates on S, then we say that phi entails psi if, well, now we want to say here, what we want to say is, so the way we think of it is like this. You don't say that things are true or false. Instead, what you say is, you say that evidence R shows phi of X to be true. Okay, that's how you speak. You never say it's just true or false. You always say, what's the evidence? And of course, there can be lots of evidence. There can be many R's that uh, are evidence of phi of X. So entailment means that we map, that there is a computable way of mapping in, uh, evidence of phi to evidence of psi, but you have to do this in the right way. So there is a computable realizer, very importantly to have a prime here, okay? Such that if you have any element in S, and then you have two realizers, T and U, in A. Then you have, if T realizes X and U realizes phi of X, then, so we are in a situation where we have evidence U that phi of X holds, then this realizer R, if you apply it to U, to T and to U, so you have to tell it what element you're at, T and U, then you will get evidence of Psi. That's the logical entanglement, and then you can work out how the rest of the logic works, and you can calculate how to do implication and conjunction and all of that. Um, I'm not going to uh, produce produce it here because we don't really need it, but if you've ever seen realizability, it's that. If you've ever seen propositions as types, it's propositions as types expressed in terms of realizers. Um, so uh, it's uh, if, you, if you know about the BHK interpretation of constructive mathematics, it's that thing formalized using the realizers. Okay, now... Um, these are predicates, so what we really want to know is, in realizability, what does instance reducibility come to? So what does phi 
is instance reducible to psi corresponds to? Well, it's going to hold if and only if we can realize there's a realizer, a computable one, for the statement, right? Which statement is this? For, for all x in A, there exists a y in B such that psi of y implies 5x. Okay, so now you go and you say, what is this in terms of realizability interpretation? Or if you are a type theorist, what is this in propositions as types? And you see that what you're going to get is you're going to get a function. Well, you're going to get two functions or one function package. Pack, you could get two functions. Maybe they're packed together as one. But essentially, you're going to have something that maps axis to y's. And we're going to call this thing L1. And then there's going to be something else which works here to realize this implication L2. But this L2 won't just depend on this bit. It will also be told what x it has, right? It's also going to be given x. It's also an argument to L2. So those will be the two essential bits. And uh, I can just, I will just actually copy and paste. Uh... When you say propositions as types, do you also mean that for psi and phi, or do they need to be sub-singletons? Uh, these are predicates on the set S, so they're maps from uh, S to prop, find psi. But yes, but prop, uh, when you say propositions and types... Prop well, is propositions as propositions. I'm not trying to be super exact, I'm just trying to tell you what to think of to figure out why they were going to get these realizers here. It doesn't matter whether you think that psi and phi are single-valued or multi-valued, in both cases you will get this L2. So it's, 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 it's not really, uh, that, that bit doesn't really contribute to what will be the shape of, of, of this. Okay, uh, where is this? Let me just... Uh, okay, yes, so what do these L2, let's spell out what these L2 and L1 work, do. Okay, so this is, after you do this, you get, okay, so this is if and only if there are computable L1 and L2. So now the Weirauch, if you, if you know Weirauch reducibilities, you will now see that you will get almost the same thing. Um, so there are such that, such that what? Uh, such that for all uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, for all uh, x in A, s in, oh, sorry, uh, we had phi was, these are, these are a little, I'm being a little bit, I'm being a little bit sloppy here, so, because I didn't tell you that here we have, let's say, oops, let's say that phi Phi is, is on, phi is a, a predicate on some assembly S and Psi is now some predicate on assembly T. This is important because um, up here they were both on S. So we are switching now to the case where we have Phi and Psi, each is on its own set and we want to calculate what this means. Oh, it was, oh, 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 oh. Here it was already A and B. Let me see what's in my notes. In my notes it's S and T, so I want to keep them S and T here, S and T, otherwise I'll get utterly confused. Okay, so what do we want to say now? So for all X in, for all X in here, so now in the, in the underlying set, and if you have a realizer, uh, S, and such that S realizes there are too many S's at this point. I'll try to use different fonts. S realizes X. Okay. Whenever you have any realizer here, then 
there exists. Mind you, when I say there exists, I didn't say that you have to be able to compute this y because that's just something that's in a set. So there is a sort of a classical component here such that now L1, if you apply it to S, so when you pass L1, a realizer for this little x, it will give you a realizer for some y in here. Okay, So this is going to realize in T our y. Um, importantly, keep in mind that many different y's could be realized by the same realizer. So this L1 of s does not necessarily uniquely tell you which y we're talking about. There could be many. But there has to be at least one. Okay, so that's the first condition. Uh, and now we continue with this L2 here for all P such that P realizes Psi of Y. We have L2. Well, what do you give to L2? You give L2 this S, so you tell it you don't tell it, you, you give it a realizer for x. Once again, it will learn something about x, maybe, from this s, but it may not be able to, this s, again, does not necessarily uniquely determine which x we're talking about. Um, and then you give it p, and it's going to produce evidence of 5x. So this is what the realizability interpretation is of instance reducibility. And it's similar to viral degrees. And I'm going to spell out now also the viral degrees. Um, but before I do that, I will just say one other thing. Uh, namely, what do viral degrees actually correspond to? Okay, so in terms of the instance reducibility lattice, uh, we have the following in realizability. the viral degrees, whatever. So I will tell you the definition uh, later, but um, I want to record this fact first. The viral degrees correspond to instance degrees of not not dense predicates on modest assemblies. So if I drew a picture of what happens in realizability, it here's some here's an inaccurate picture. Okay? So we have this as before. Here we have the omega but this omega now, here, this is known as the Medvedev lattice because this is just going to be the familiar embedding of the Medvedev lattice into, into uh, viral degrees. Up here we have this other upside down Medvedev lattice and then somewhere in here there is excluded middle which is the largest not not dense degree and then below, well, I don't know how to do below. There's this, there's this now in, in type two effectivity, there is definitely going to be stuff out here. And I will speak about it. There will be stuff out here, which isn't just top. And so then in here, you have the things which are the not, not dense ones. And then among them, some of them, appear on modest assemblies. So they're here, and I haven't really been able to give a good characterization of what they are, but it's all of these, definitely. So these are all, these all happen to be on modest assemblies, and they're all not, not dense, they're below. So this stuff here is all viral degrees, and then there's some bit here, up here, which extends. Um, so I think that's that's the that's the scope sort of 
uh, we get a little bit more here. And then there is stuff outside. And I'm going to show you some stuff that's outside. Um, Andre, can, yes. can you also draw the image of the upside down omega in the upper thing? Does it include LEM or? Yes. Uh, the upside down omega is just this entire lemon. It's the entire thing, okay. Yeah, yeah. so and then there's maybe a little bit more around it. I, I thought you set only it embeds into it, that it's yeah. not everything. Okay. There's still more outside here. Ah, there is yeah, more. Yeah, lem, well, lem is bit, lem goes in, uh, I think lem lands. Uh, in the lemon. <laughs> Ah, maybe I'm not. Okay, so maybe I misspoke. You're asking whether LEM lands in the image of, in the other embedding of Omega. The other embedding yes. of Omega mm -hmm. uh, takes a proposition P to um, to what? To the constant to the constant predicate P on one. So no, I don't. Like I don't know. I don't think so. well that will depend because if lem is true then yes because then everything collapses yeah. you see <laughs> you don't have a you don't have a, I don't have a unique answer but in general I think maybe not so much okay maybe yeah so I think uh, I would like to understand all of this a lot better and what is my hope is that if I explain this sufficiently well then maybe um, people who have studied viral degrees will We'll see where to you know, pick this up and, and how, to, how, how to give a nice explanation of the extended degrees. So I would like to uh, um, now give an explicit definition of extended degrees. So, so far we know that if we interpret instance, re instance degrees in realizability, then we're going to get something which contains viral... We'll get something, and when you look at it, it looks a lot like Vaurov degrees. This is a lot like Vaurov degrees. And if you try to say, okay, so, but what is different? Well, it's some business regarding this multi-valued representation, right? So if I, if, I, if, if, if I walked into CCA and say, can you please define uh, Vaurov degrees using uh, multi-valued representations, then something like this might emerge, right? So, um, it looks very similar, so let's make this connection exact and just see what exactly is going on. Um, so I'm now going to describe all of these instance degrees in a language that is closer to how Virov degrees are usually presented so that then we can compare the two definitions. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I will now give you... Uh, uh, I will, we're going to describe instance degrees in realizability, all of them, but in an explicit form that is close to how viral degrees are usually presented. I think that's, that, that should be useful for comparing. Before we do that, let's do, let, we do should repeat what a viral degree is. Now, there are many ways of uh, uh, explaining what a viral degree is, and the one that I would like to um, use here is the following one. is given like this. So one of these degrees can be thought of as a subset of pairs of realizers. Um, in the concrete case of type two effectivity, A and A would both be the bare space, the space of infinite sequences. But really there is nothing particular to that particular model uh, and viral degrees can be defined just as well in any realizability, relative realizability model. All you need is a realizability model which has uh, two, a PCA for data, a sub-PCA for the realizers of computable reductions, and then you can do viral degrees in any realizability model. And by the way, I don't think this has been explored much, but I think it would be interesting to do, to, to see what these lattices look like um, say in sequential functionals, which are quite similar to how TTE works, but are known to be not to be equivalent, they're not equivalent, and there will be some uh, differences there. And even more importantly, I think, it would be to study that if you have transformations between realizability models, they will do something to these lattices. But that's, 
No, I'd do that if I were a PhD student. Uh, I, I'm not going to do that. So if somebody else wants to pick this up, you're welcome to. Okay, so we call the support of this thing is the set of those realizers R, which have something in the second component. So that is S such that RS is in U. And the reason we're writing this is because we can think of this as a map. So U as a map takes a realizer R and returns the set of all those S's such that RS is in U. And now we see the true character of this is that this is actually a multi-valued map which goes from the support to now whatever your notation for multi-valued map is to realizers. And because we, if we think of it as a map on the support, it will always return a non-empty set. We apply this R, so here we think of R as being in the support, so this is always going to be non-empty, and that's the reason for not not dense. That is why viral degrees are not not dense, because this is always non-empty. That is to say, in the viral degrees, a move has been made, which is quite natural to consider, namely, that it's stupid to have degrees with counterexamples, right? So why would, you cons why would you try to prove a universal statement which has a counterexample? You wouldn't. You can't do it. Nevertheless, that is what the top degree is. And so if you allow, you know, now we're going to generalize. And one of the things that we do is we can drop this. Uh, we, will drop, we will allow there to be no realizers. Not quite in this uh, general form. It's not quite just going to be, oh, yeah, this can be an empty set. It's a little trickier than that. But anyway, this is what a viral degree is like. And the way you can think of it is, Given a realizer R, so given a problem question, this is a problem question, this is my element X in A, I have a bunch of answers, right? And now I would like to say what a reduction is. So what is a reduction? So now if I have another one of these, uh, a reduction from U to say some other degree V, when, what is this? Okay, there are L1 and L2, computable, importantly, such that, okay, uh, I always get confused with these quantifiers, so let me not get confused with the quantifiers. Mm -hmm. Okay, such that uh, for all realizers in the support, of U, first of all, L1 will map this realizer to some instance of the problem V. So it will say, please solve instance. We're going to reduce the instance R to the instance L1 of R. And two, um, if you have any answer to V, so if S is an answer, to V L1 of R, then L2, when you say, hey, L2, we're, somebody told us about R that when we transformed it, S was an answer, then L2 is going to say, okay, then we can compute an answer to R. This is what a viral degree is. This is one way of explaining what a viral degree is. Um, okay, so now, uh, now I'm going to generalize this and define extended viral degrees. which are just an equivalent formulation of instance reducibilities in a realizability model. So these are all instance degrees in a realizability model, but phrased in this language. Okay. So what's a degree? A degree is going to be a map 
So you see already here it was a multi-valued map. So now it's going to be similar. So it's a map from A to the power set of the power set of A. Right? So here there was a single power set really, right? Because you could transpose this by transposition. You can get here some transposed map which will go from A to the power set of A. Okay, so now we have a double power set, which is accounting for the fact that we have uh, non-modest sets, that we have assemblies which are not modest. And then what is we still have the support. What is the support of U? It's those R's in A for which U of R is not empty. And this matches the other one. Because if you explain this one in terms of maps, you would exactly say, well, it's those R's for which U of R is not empty. So the support is the same thing here. And then we have already the uh, reduction. So again, to, not to confuse myself. Where are they? Here. Okay, so now suppose I have two such things. So I have V also. Then we say that this one is reducible in this extended Virov sense to the other one if we have L1 and L2 computable such that for all R in the first, the support of the first one, we have, um, I'm copying the right one, yes, first of all, this part is the same, L1 of R is going to calculate an instance in the other one. Okay. But this second one will now change because I have the power set of the power set. So what we write is this. For every theta in u of r, there is psi in V of L1R such that L2 applied to R and S uh, such that, no, L2 applied to R realizes psi implies Theta, and we can spell this out a little further, what this means, this thing here, in realizability logic means, if S realizes, t, uh, sorry, Xi, then L2S, L2RS realizes Theta. That's what it means. Okay, so what happens? So what happened was that it's pretty much the same up to the second point where something where what we have in the extended case is we have a bunch of these, it's as if we had a bunch of problems bunched together. So a single realizer R here, if you observe what U is, okay? So in the in the case of viral degrees, you think of U of R, you think of R as naming one particular instance of a problem. And once you have the R in your hand, you know precisely, compute, you computationally know what instance you're talking about. So to have this R here is to have the precise, infor, precise computational information about what instance are we talking about. What is here, things are layered. So once you have R, 
then u of r can still have many elements because it's the power set of the power set of a. So u of r can have many elements. And so now which element from u of r we are going to have, so there are many possible thetas, r does not give us any computational information about which theta we're talking about. Right? So L2 will have to sort of magically work for all these thetas without having access to any information about which particular theta there is. R may carry some information about thetas, right? But not all of it. And then similarly here on the target side, L2, here L2 had to calculate an answer. So here L2 has to transform uh, the uh, solution to V, it transforms it to the solution for U of R. But here, L2 transforms the solution for Xi, S, right, to solution for this theta here without having to know, let's see, what does it know? It does, there's something it doesn't have to know. Well, it doesn't have to explain which theta it was, okay? So there are differences, but this is what it comes down to. This is, this is what instance reducibilities are in terms of extended viral degrees. Um, the preprint has proofs uh, explaining that this is the, you know, how this is, um, that this really corresponds to instance reducibilities. Now I think the interesting question is what can we do with this thing, right? Is this good for anything? Because maybe there's nothing interesting there to be said. But before I do that, let me just explain how we map viral degrees into extended viral degrees. So why are one a generalization of the other, okay? So from ordinary to extended viral degrees, how do we go, okay? So we take a U, which is a subset of A cross A. And then um, we map it to u, let me call it u bar or u hat, and it goes from a to the power set of the power set of a. What does it do? It takes, it works like this, uh, u of r is, well, it's the singleton u r, if R is in the support of U, and otherwise empty set, because we're outside of the support. So the extended viral degrees are the ones where you always get this singleton set, and moreover, what you have inside is non-empty. This UR will always be non-empty. Non-empty is the not not density, the fact that it's a singleton is the modest condition that you have a singleton here. That's what the viral degrees are inside the extended viral degrees. And if you now apply this definition of extended viral reduction to the case where you know that you have this singleton business, there won't be any choice for theta and for xi, and it will reduce precisely to the, uh, to the other definition. Um, notice also that here we allow, it may happen, that u of r contains the empty set. So this theta here could be empty, and this psi here could be empty. This is this additional business that we allow counterexamples. We allow reductions to statements which have no solution. It's not that they have a difficult solution that can't be computed. They have no solution in the case where you have the theta equals empty set. And that's how you get the top degree. Um, Okay, I have about 10 minutes, so let me see. I'm going to give the audience, so what do we do? Okay, so let's look at some examples. I think this is maybe interesting to look at. For instance, what is going, what would be an example of an extended viral degree which um, isn't a viral degree? So what else could you do? Okay, so first of all, um, if we are in a continuous model of type 2 effectivity so that the um, 
the computable things are the same as all the computable real, all realizers are deemed computable, so that would correspond to continuous represent to, to represent via, uh, bare representations with continuously realized maps. In that case, um, then you don't have anything interesting uh, outside of the not not dense degrees because here, if uh, the only degree which isn't not not dense so that means is not below excluded middle is the top degree and the reason is that uh, in such a model if you have uh, if you not not have a counterexample you're going to have a counterexample more or less so the interesting case so we consider instead the case when a prime is not everything, um, such as Vyroch, such as TTE. In TTE, this doesn't happen. So uh, this will exclude uh, type one computability, where you have natural numbers for your realizers, both for functions and for data. So it's better to consider some proper set here, e.g., like the effective bearer space, the computable one, inside and to the end. Okay, so a degree that is going to be interesting is this. We have the assembly n to the n. What is this? I'm going to call it just f for functions. So these are the realized maps. f from natural numbers to natural numbers such that f is realized. There exists a computable real, uh, or there exists, no, actually, sorry, there exists any realizer, so continuously realized. There exists any realizer in A such that R tracks F. Okay? Um, and now we're going to have a predicate on this, which I'm going to call CT for Church's thesis. A predicate on this assembly F. Let me call it like this. So a realizability predicate. So it has to take f to a set of realizers, and it's going to take f to the set of numerals. So we're going to take numerals n. This is encoding of some natural number such that the nth partial map is f. Nth partial computable map. In other words, this is the set of codes of Turing machines that compute F. It could be empty when F is non-computable, so that means that this is not, a, it, it, it will fail to be not not dense. This is not a viral degree because sometimes it will happen that CT of F is empty, and so it's, it, 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 it's, not, it's not, not, not dense. Nevertheless, in, uh, in case like this one, where we have uh, non-computable realizers, and uh, uh, this is going to, well, so first of all, this is, uh, this is a predicate, and now this predicate is sitting here, so CT is not a viral degree, because it's not, not not dense, there are too many knots. And also, CT is not the trivial top degree. Because it doesn't have a counterexample. You might be thinking, well, how can it not have a counterexample? Any non-computable map is a counterexample. 
Well, but to have a counterexample, you need to realize the statement that exists an F such that not CTF. But any realizer R of such a statement must be computable. It has to be in A prime, it has to be computable. Uh, I'm thinking of the case of type 2 effectivity here. But if it's computable, then it realizes a computable F. But if it realizes a computable F, then this cannot happen that this is empty. So there really is no counterexample to this. And so this is a predicate which is uh, outside of the scope of viral degrees, but also it's not trivial. And so, for instance, this should allow uh, talking about reductions from the assumption that all maps are computable. So you just say, that so this the, the, the instance problem here is all maps is, is you're trying to you're thinking about the problem of f being computable and uh, well yes some f's but then some 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 f's are non computable but we can never positively witness the facts Compute, we cannot co computably witness the fact that f is non computable so that's that's an example of a degree that i think is interesting and it's this sort of thing which i'm hoping can be brought in to enlarge the scope of reductions. Um, so uh, I guess I can stop here. The, the, the preprint has some other business about understanding the reductions from non-modest degrees. It's at the very end of the preprint, which plays on this business here that in an extended viral degree, you don't have to compute which psi you're talking about. This just says for every instance theta, there is some psi and you can use this to have a more flexible notion of reduction where a reduction has to work without access to a certain parameter. So it has to be independent of some parameter. Or maybe you can have a... So, and also the other thing you can do, you can have a reduction which doesn't have to completely reduce the problem, which can reduce only part of the problem, but it leaves the rest sort of to classical reasoning. To, it doesn't have to compute the entire solution. And these are also ways of making things more flexible in, in this world of, of, of calculating reductions between things. Okay, I'll stop here, and if there are any questions, um, I'll, be, I'll try to answer them. Thank you. Um, I have a question on the, uh, the existence of Supremer of stuff which is given in a suitably effective way. Yes. Um, sort of have you do 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 you have a, a sort of explicit construction of what that means uh, for variety? Um, yes, I do. Wait, I have. I wrote it out. Let's see. I wrote it out for. Um, for assemblies, maybe not for the extended viral degrees, but that's something we can do offline. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to be too hard to do it. I also wrote out explicitly what implication looks like, uh, which I think you might find interesting, um, how to calculate implications um, between, because now you can, so you can take an, any two viral degrees and calculate the implication between them. It's a funny business that I haven't actually uh, found any, I, I was not able, I mean, you can, you can calculate the implication, but it's kind of non, it's very general. It's very non-descriptive. Descript, it's not, this description is not nice because I just derived it from the fact that uh, every frame has an implication, which is largest uh, element such that something holds. And when you write it down, you just get some bunch of sets. And I think yep. it would be very interesting to study what that implication brings to viral reducibility. But you're also, yes, also the, um, also the uh, Suprema uh, have to be made computable. But I would, I, would I, would, I would suggest that if we do that offline, like together and then go through it because it's a little, you know, finicky. Yep, looks good. Yeah. Thank you. I have one more question if I can. Sure. Um, uh, and a remark, maybe I should give the remark first, <clears throat> because I, I, you said propositions as types and then immediately I start calculating what is instance reducibility of something like the fundamental cover of yes, the circle. Yes, and, and of course I relied on <laughs> you doing that in the background. <laughs> um, <laughs> so there, uh, there are many nice examples there. Uh, for uh, Yeah, let's do, just do the 
uh, type of two element sets and let uh, phi of x be the, the two element set then uh, then it's uh, then it's above this uh, above this one t1 thing but it's below top of course you, you can uh, so we have top the t1 thing what are you putting in here uh, the type of two element sets with uh, the but it needs to be a predicate with what predicate no, we did propositions as type. Ah, okay, so, so I was going all in on that. Okay, okay. So what is the type of two element predicates? <laughs> uh, so you, the the underlying type is the type of all two element types, and um, <clears throat> and uh, and then the predicate on that is uh, is the two element type. Oh, just like the identity. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yes. Okay. okay. So that so... that sits below. Um, and uh, below that, you also have the fundamental cover of the circle, uh, and they are different. Uh, and these are interesting because they are all. Uh, uh, which one? What universal cover of? Of the circle. Okay. Cool. Uh, and and they, they are di uh, different and interesting because they are all like inhabited, uh, like predicates, so to say, yes. families yes. of types. Yes. By the way, uh, uh, but uh, you cannot prove universal quantification for them. By the way, you have that a thing is above a phi is above this if and only if the underlying type is inhabited. Yeah. Ah, yes. This is easy to calculate. So okay, above is point. precisely the things that uh, precisely the predicates of inhabited types. Okay. So it's yeah. Yes. And and then the fact that they are different, uh, these two things in the middle. Yes. Um, that's uh, that's the fact that the loop on S one is like free, and the other one has order two. Ah, so um, you're you're separating here using uh, univalent magic. Yes. Yes. Good. Uh, okay. And okay, and um, I still have my question, which is simpler than all of this. Yes, uh, has not, nothing to do with hot. You draw it as two lemons on top of each yes. other, but you never said that every um, uh, predicate is either below the thing in the middle or above in the thing in the middle. Yes, is that is that even true? Um... This. No. So, excluded middle is the same to say that every instance degree is equivalent to one of these three, or to say that instance reducibilities are a total order, or to say every instance degree is either below or above T1. All of those are equivalent to excluded middle. Oh, okay. So, actually, the uh, picture about uh, lemons is, uh, is a bit misleading then. Well, you can't because show. There's more around it. But you can't explicitly demonstrate that there is things around it in general. So in particular models, in particular models, there will be things around it somewhere here in the white area, right? And for instance, in, in well, in univalent mathematics, it would be quite nice if you can show me a degree which is not in one of the lemons. Okay. But, but in general, uh, we don't know that there is something out there. Okay, so if, if there, there can be things in the white area around the gray area, then what is the difference between the white and the gray areas? So if they what? If there can? So, so things can be outside of those gray areas. Yes. That's what you're telling me now. So what is the difference between those, uh, the white and the gray areas in this picture? Well, the gray areas, so the first gray area is uh, just things. Oh, that, that's omega. It's only it's the two omegas are gray, mm -hmm. and but then true, true. the white stuff is possibly things which are outside of that. But then you draw LEM inside omega. So that was uh, yeah, different. that may be a mistake. I have to think about that. Okay. I think LAM might be a little, it's, it's kind of flu fluent. If LAM equals top, then everything collapses. If it doesn't equal top, then it might be somewhere else. But it might actually also be equivalent to one of these omega things. But I yeah, don't know. Maybe, I have to think about a, it. Yeah. Maybe it's a proposition for every PP or not PP. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. This picture need, okay, yeah, you're right. Lem is in a fishy place, yes. Okay. Yes. Those are my remarks and okay, questions. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Uh, 
Time to discuss lunch. If there are no further questions. Anybody who is in Slovenia in Ljubljana and wants to have lunch, yes. well, just come to the Slack channel. We'll do it there. Or to the common room. Or to the common room, yes. I think that's more efficient. Yeah, let's just go to the common room. Uh, but we should still slack the fact that we're going to the common room. Because I don't, I don't, I don't think we're all here. Or maybe we're all here. Uh, I'd like to thank very much the visitors who came. Thanks uh, to listen. Uh, is Arno is gone? Yes, most of them are gone by now. I'll stay in touch with Arno. So, thanks guys.